So uh, without further ado, I think we're going to go ahead and start. I know there's still people coming through the door. Uh, in case you missed my last announcement, please pop questions into the Q&A at any time. I have a bunch of colleagues, Anastasia, Chai, Brenton. We're here to answer your questions sort of in real time. And then if there are really interesting uh, questions that we have time to get to at the end, uh, we'll go ahead and pop those on um, at the end, and we'll give them to our panelists. Um, so I am super excited. Um, really, we have an amazing panel today. Uh, so thank you, Brenton. Uh, Rhoda Strawbridge from the University of Glasgow, um, who works on just an immense amount of different things and an immense amount of different data types and thinks a whole bunch about integrating them. Uh, Suda Vachuri, uh, from Penn State and, uh, my uh, colleague, Matt Newman from Solution Science, will be very excited to see that we have somebody from Penn State here. Uh, he's a bit of a fan. Um, and then finally, my uh, colleague, Andre Klimpier, uh from DNA Nexus, who does a lot of work with image-derived phenotypes. So um, I'm really excited uh, to be here uh, with these folks. And I think uh, I think this is going to be a really interesting discussion, an inform informative discussion, but also hopefully this will have things uh, that are actionable for you. And we'll probably talk a lot about uh, image-derived phenotypes, like I said, integrating that with genomics and phenotype, integrating genomics and phenotype per se, uh, as well as integrating other data types like, phen uh, like uh, proteomics and carotid ultrasound and all that. Uh, if somebody doesn't bring up a data type you're interested in, let us know, uh, and uh, you know we'll uh, we'll either ask our panel about it or we'll get into it during a different webinar or presentation. So uh, that's great. Well, it's great to see so many people here. Uh, I think without further ado, uh, we will uh, go ahead and kick off. So first, uh, Suda, uh, congratulations on the new job. And you know I've seen some talks you've given at conferences and so on, um, but. Can you tell us uh, about your research and also why large data sets are important to you? Um, thank you, Ben. Uh, so a little bit about my research. So I um, have a joint appointment at Penn State in the departments of biobehavioral health and statistics. Um, and I'm a statistical geneticist by training. So my interests lie in trying to understand um, genetic underpinnings of disease and also to develop statistical models that could help me in understanding disease better. So, uh, and I work on integrating multiple layers of high dimensional data, be it uh, multi-omics, you know, genomics, transcriptomics, and so forth, with uh, um, recently with it, uh, um, neuroimaging that is using the image derived phenotypes from UK Biobank and electronic health record information and other environmental variables and so forth to better understand um, uh, not just the genetic underpinnings of disease, but also um, uh, patterns in human disease and if there uh, exist shared genetics uh, between multiple complex diseases and disease categories. So uh, in particular, I'm interested in understanding uh, the genetics of cognitive decline and neurodegeneration. And uh, um, so can we identify you know, using data-driven approaches, putative causal mechanisms underlying cognitive decline and, and uh, uh, neurodegeneration. And um, also another interest of mine is to develop statistical, advanced statistical and computational tools to um, understand or quantify the extent of genetic heterogeneity that exists between sexes and different ancestral groups pertaining to a certain disease. Um, so in general, um, I am interested in, in in trying to figure out if we can tease apart the influence of these different layers that I mentioned before, um, you know, genomics versus the environment and, you know, uh, other layers of high dimensional data. If we can tease apart their influence on disease and, and what are creative ways in which we can integrate them together to um, develop better predictive models and uh, identify, um, you know, the disease risk of a patient. Uh, before that patient gets afflicted or that individual gets afflicted with disease. So, yeah, so those are some of my interests. So they're very varied right now. <laughs> uh, awesome. So, 
Uh, really, at the end, I, I really, I think I'm going to have a lot of questions for you about Pliotropy. Uh, yeah. So uh, hopefully we can get to that. Um, but what I want to do now is is move over to Rhoda uh, and, and really ask Rhoda about uh, some of the relatively similar things uh, that she's been thinking uh, about, uh, both in somewhat uh, the cardiac space, uh, as well as uh, in the case of uh, some uh, neurological dysfunctions. Hi, yeah, thanks for inviting me to, to be part of this. So I'm working in Glasgow University and I use genetic data to understand the link between mental and physical health, specifically severe mental illness and cardiovascular and metabolic diseases. We know, we've known for a long time from epidemiology that individuals with mental illness have much higher rates of cardiovascular disease obesity and type 2 diabetes, but really why this happens is not very well known. If you use epidemiology data, it's hard to tell which, which one came first, what is causing it, or whether or not there are the same mechanisms contributing to both diseases, uh, mental and physical illnesses. So using genetics, they're stable over your lifetime, you can assess, you can, they're very powerful for being able to assess the connection between two different disease types. Um, and I use mainly genetic data with phenotypic data, so measurements of how, how people, um, how tall they are, what they weigh, um, the blood biomarkers, um, whether they feel happy or not, what the questions they've answered. But I've also started to use imaging data as well, and I see potential for <laughs> the more data you add, the more exciting is the research can be, but the more complicated. But it's all good fun, right? If it was simple, it'd be boring. <laughs> so uh, maybe I could go off the rails a little bit uh, at this point. And, and actually, maybe we'll just jump into pleiotropy, since uh, I think a lot of what you just talked about uh, really thinks that points towards pleiotropy and then come back to, to some other questions about large data sets and, and some other data type things. Um, and so I guess a question for both of you, could you talk a little bit about how you think about pleiotropy in these, these like very common diseases um, and, and how, that, how that affects your research and, and how that affects sort of uh, the work you do integrating genomic data as well as imaging data? Can I, guess? I can... <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> off to okay. you. All right, after me. Uh, so. Um... So pleiotropy, so for the most recent work that we did, the the focus was to kind of try and identify these um, shared genetics and genetic pathways between multiple disease categories. And so our goal was to kind of identify pleiotropy. And, um, and so that was more of a hypothesis generating research because uh, we were looking at diseases across the quote unquote phenome. So, um, since we were working uh, with image derived phenotypes, uh, you know the common. I mean, you'd, you'd commonly think that we'd, we'd start with uh, diseases, uh, neurological diseases, and other diseases in the nervous system. But we were looking at cardiovascular diseases. We were looking at digestive disorders. We were looking at uh, some neoplasms, respiratory system diseases, kidney related diseases. So just across the across the phenome, um, we were uh, using electronic health record information from. Uh, two large-scale biobanks, one of which was the UK Biobank, and the other was the Electronic Medical Records and Genomics, so the eMERGE cohort. Um, so, um, yeah, basically trying to see if we can identify shared genetics or, or common genes that underlie both neuroimaging measures as well as some of these disease phenotypes. And in order to do that, can we creatively integrate um, the genomic information that's currently available with some of the transcriptomic information that's uh, not currently available as part of the UK Biobank, but um, is measured on an independent set of samples. Um, so that becomes a challenge because you don't typically have these multi-omic um, data measured in the same set of patients. So how do you do multi-omic data integration when you don't even have the data measured in the same set of patients, especially when you are working on biobank scale data, right? So um, and there are a lot of tools out there in the bioinformatics community that can creatively, you know, bridge that gap. And so we were trying to deploy them at biobank scale to 
um, to try and um, um, understand, you know, the association between a given gene and a given phenotype, which in our case was both neuroimaging uh, data in, in, in the form of IDPs and disease data using the electronic health record, the ICD-10 disease codes from the biobank and, um, and ICD-9 disease codes from eMERGE, which we had converted to free codes for our, for our purpose. But, um, does that somewhat answer your question? Absolutely. No, and I have a follow-up question about variant annotation in a bit, but I know Rona had something she wanted to say here, so uh, maybe I can kick it over to her and then, uh, and then we'll bring it back uh, to variant annotation. And I actually also have a follow-up uh, question about sort of use of biobanks uh, and thinking about that as well. So, uh, but first, uh, Rona, you had something you wanted to say. So, yeah, pleiotropy is... <laughs> To me, it's a word that's chucked around a lot that says a genetic locus is involved in more than one thing. So one of the ways of the research that I've been doing, one way we're looking at it is to look in detail at that locus to try to understand, not even using very complicated methods, but try to understand, is there one signal that's influencing two different traits? Or are there just two different signals in the region influencing different traits? So some of my work is quite basic, but looking in great detail at these pleiotropic loci. And then if you find a signal, one signal that's influencing, say, obesity and mood disorders, then adding layers of biomarkers, transcriptomics, to try and understand that pathway is really, really cool. Um, and I can tell you quite a few of the lo loci we've looked at, it's just two different things happening in the same region. There are some where it seems to be there might be a shared pathway, but most of the loci we've looked at so far are saying there's just a lot going on here. That's awesome. Okay, actually, I want to come back to that and talk a little bit about find mapping uh, in large scale data sets. Uh, but, but first, I want to kick it back to Suda um, and really uh, think about annotations. So, so you have these large databases and you have uh, pleiotropic loci that you've identified and that you're, uh, you're, you're doing stuff with. How do you, how do you take that? And, and share it with other people, those those sort of annotations of potentially pleiotropic loci or loci that are just uh, uh, important. Because as you said, it's really important to be able to say, uh, to cross between different uh, studies and different uh, data types. So how do we make them available? Is that the question? Yeah, well, how do you make the information available, right? So say I have a SNP and you, you tell me that it's it's important and maybe I'm taking phenotypes uh, from Rhoda, but like say you, you tell me it's important in uh, obesity and some sort of neurodegenerative disease, right? Okay. What, what I want to know is um, like, uh, you know, what what is the longer term impact of being able to annotate that in large scale biobanks? Right, so we were, like I mentioned before with the, the study that we conducted looking at generating new hypotheses and since we were looking at a phenome-wide approach and trying to identify these fine mapped regions that associate with both um, a certain neuroimaging measure from a certain region of the brain as well as a given disease right and we we're looking at multiple disease categories um, so of course you know uh, I think data visualization per se becomes extremely important especially when you present this work um, uh, you know, at conferences or uh, elsewhere, um, and in a an presentation format, what's critically important to convey the research you've done to an outside audience is to um, this, is to niftily uh, visualize how you've integrated these multiple layers of data, and we've used tools in R and Python and created uh, some tools ourselves um, in you know in the lab that I did this work in as a postdoc. Um, to, to be able to visualize so many layers of data because we had electronic health records and we had uh, genetics and we had transcriptomics and we had IDPs and all of these are high dimensional. So I think uh, effective visualization, um, perhaps be, be doing some kind of network based analyses, uh, which we had explored mm -hmm. is, is critical to convey the information, um, or actually convey what we were attempting to do to a large scale audience. So that is one facet of it. And uh, and in uh, actually um, in a ta in a more tangible manner, just making the summary statistics themselves available uh, to the general public. Um, you know, just when we the manuscript is still 
um, it's, it's, it's still being written right now. So uh, once that's close to submission, we will, you know, make all of those summary statistics publicly available so that people, our, our vision is for people to be able to download some of these and look at any particular combination of disease and uh, immigrant phenotype of interest to them, and then uh, perhaps do a deep dive into that a little further and uh, you know run with it and perhaps do a, you know a functional validation because uh, that's necessary too. A lot of them are proof of concept based on previously published literature, but uh, many of them are, are not yet are novel. So um, so our goal is for 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 this research to be able to generate novel hypotheses if that makes sense and uh, uh, and I'm uh, in, you know at Penn State trying to kind of run off of some of these uh, the offshoots of this large-scale research to you know devise PhD topics for my students. <laughs> uh, that's fantastic and I mean I, I hope the audience is excited about uh, thinking about being able to grab some of these summary stats for pleiotropic variants or potentially pleiotropic variants in low side. We'll, we'll talk to Rhoda about that in a minute. And then and then be able to riff off of that and think about novel drug targets and all of those so, sorts of things. So going back to Rhoda, Rhoda, a fine mapping kind of came up. I mean, that, that, was, that was sort of something that jumped out at me. So can you talk a little bit about how, you'd, uh, how you approach GWAS, fine mapping, looking at multiple... Uh, specific SNPs within a loci uh, when you're doing these uh, these sort of large scale studies. Yeah, absolutely. So the GWAS catalog is the repository for all um, information found by genetic association studies in large scale studies to um, that highlighted loci associated with different traits. You can look up a locus in the GWAS catalog or a phenotype and find all the results that have been published for that that input. So I find it, I take a locus and see which phenotypes have been associated using a GWAS study. The trouble is until the data sets such as UK Biobank came about, each study looked at heart disease or diabetes or schizophrenia. So it was very hard to compare between studies, the different recruitment styles, the different phenotyping, a lack of phenotyping in a lot of cases. So large scale data sets like UK Biobank are hugely valuable because now we have the mental health traits and the physical health traits measured in the same people with all the DNA and all the gen genotyping measured for a huge number of people. So we can start to do the analyses where we look at one genetic region in a big enough population that we can assess the effects of that genetic region on schizophrenia and mood instability and risk-taking behavior and blood glucose levels and um, yeah, measurements of the intermedia thickness, which is a sign of heart disease um, vascular remodeling. So having one data set with all of this huge amount of data means we can really do a very good job of fine mapping. And if this is the genetic region, we can see that, yeah, which part of the region is influencing which traits, which part of the region, if it's one part of the region, influencing all the traits, maybe we can start to look at the mechanism, adding more data like the transcriptomics, which we don't have in Biobank. There, there could be improvements for the transcriptomic data, but what we have is still useful. And ultimately, my aim is to see if we can identify the mechanisms and the pathways that link mental and physical illness. And there are plenty of drugs currently used for cardiovascular disease for diabetes, starting to see some for obesity as well. Maybe if we can identify the pathways, maybe we can repurpose some existing drugs. Identifying novel drug targets, awesome. But maybe we can also repurpose existing drugs to improve the symptoms of mental health, mental illness, to improve mental health. Um, awesome. So uh, I, there's two things I, I want to follow up on, but but I'm going to parking lot them for a minute because I, I want to do two other things first. The two things I want to follow up on is is really I want to talk about the single cell data, um, the single cell RNA seq data that's coming out in October 23, uh, and how you're going to want to integrate that with UK Biobank. I mean, to me, that's it's going to be game changing. But I'm, I'm curious to hear what you think, and also what Suda thinks, but also uh, dovetailing into uh, effective visualization and how uh, you guys plan to use sort of a visualization of single cell 
plus the genotype and phenotype and imaging already available at UK Biobank. But I want to do two things first. First, I want to bring in Andre to talk uh, a little bit about his views, pleiotropy and imaging, particularly neuroimaging, um, and then also talk a little bit about cloud computing and how it plays into all this. Then I want to go into the single cell type of stuff. So, Andre, did you have anything you wanted to add about, I mean, I know you do a lot of this work uh, really sort of, uh, at the DNA Nexus range. And so I'm wondering if you uh, uh, you have any comments uh, about the stuff you work on um, in terms Absolutely, of- Absolutely, uh, man. Absolutely. Thanks for awesome. inviting me here. Yeah. Uh, yes, maybe first of all, before I jump into um, uh, what you what uh, what you asked, uh, I would like to maybe uh, mention the title of this roundtable. I really like it, which is Multimodal Data Integration. And as always, from my perspective, I'm commenting on the technical side. So at some point, we will get uh, into the cloud. Uh, but on this title, I really like the multi-model data. Uh, and basically, um, in our work, we typically face uh, challenges such as how to, uh, maybe before you do the real analysis and run the GIVAS and so on, there are steps which uh, needs to be taken to uh, prepare the data, uh, how to integrate it, and how to convert it to the right form. Uh, yes, for example, on the UK Biobank, uh, there are uh, representations as uh, in form of database, uh, but, uh, and we will get into the uh, image-derived phenotypes uh, at some point, and maybe other, other uh, data types. But uh, in many situations, you will need to first extract the data from raw files, from bulk files, from, let's say, raw images. So, and that's uh, that's one of the challenges, uh, basically how to uh, extract the data and how to convert it from uh, one form to another form. And then once we are done with this step, um, we can combine the data sets to, together and let's say prepare the trades and um, pre or prepare multiple trades for GVAS and FIVAS um, and uh, so on. So I wanted to like really first uh, start uh, with uh, with this challenge or uh, mention that uh, this is this is very important and uh, many gen like pu publicly available data sets uh, already uh, enables that and uh, brings the value uh, but in many cases if it's not UKB wrap or if it's not something uh, what has a great or right uh, on rich uh, data sets, uh, you will need to do that on your local machine and so on. Uh, so, uh, yeah, and uh, typically uh, what uh, uh, we can do on uh, the cloud, uh, we can run many of the things uh, we are discussing here. Uh, we can run GVAS, we can run uh, FIVAS and combine many things together uh, on the genetic level, uh, on the uh, imaging level. Uh, I have some experience, for example, with uh, neuro neuroimaging and maybe other uh, imaging data sets. Um, so, uh, and again, this is great topic for us because we are considering multi-model. So uh, we have many modalities available, uh, like uh, magnetic resonance imaging. We can work with uh, individual modalities there, T1, T2, and all of these are providing different views, different form of uh, images and different form of information, which can be really then visualized, uh, let's say, on the uh, cloud. So, uh, yeah, uh, that's pretty much maybe for the start, yeah. Uh, so, so before we get to cloud, maybe I could throw a question from Andre, what Andre just said back to uh, Rona and Suda. And, and that is really so, and, and maybe Andre, I can ask you to come in after them yeah. and, and talk about it uh, also a little bit. But, you know, obviously uh, for SNPs, you know, we have standards. We have DB SNP and then, you know, sort of uh, like evolving from that, thinking about like, you know, the GA4, GH standard VRS. Obviously for phenotypes, we have, you know, ICD-10 and ICD-9, as Suda mentioned. And, and now, uh, you know, I mean, people are harmonizing UK Biobank and other large data sets to OMOP, uh, which is super cool. Uh, but... But really, how do you guys, uh, and, and this is a question really for all of you, uh, how do you think about standardizing image-derived phenotypes um, across multiple data sets coming from 
uh, you know, coming from particular MRIs or particular uh, carotid ultrasounds and being able to standardize that and share that as a phenotype across multiple studies. Uh, maybe we'll start with Suda or Rona. Okay, um, I can start. <laughs> um, so harmonizing IDPs across multiple data sets, um, I think is going to be extremely useful effort um, to, uh, because there's going to be differences in, in, in how that uh, data set was collected, um, you know, and so across smaller cohorts, if we're able to, in different modalities, able to harmonize data, then statistically that can enhance our ability to integrate those data sets with, with phenotype. And um, uh, otherwise, you are stuck with conducting all these stratified analyses separately on each modality. And so um, so I think uh, from a statistical standpoint, it makes tremendous sense to, uh, to harmonize them across multiple data sets and standardize them so that um, you can um, integrate that entire chunk of data as a single layer with and, and associate it with your favored phenotype of interest. Um, however, um, th there might be challenges associated with doing doing that, and um, I am not I am not very well versed with the neuroimaging space per se and the challenges associated with processing raw data and harmonizing it. So I'm I'm sure that those folks might have some issues with uh, with you know the way the the data is being harmonized across uh, multiple cohorts, and so those. Um, issues need to be addressed, I think, uh, before um, before we go ahead with harmonization. And um, um, yeah, that's about what I can contribute to that question. <laughs> awesome, thanks, uh, Rhoda. Anything to add here? Um, I do have a follow up question uh, for for Suda, but so, I will I'll let you go first. Yeah. So in terms of, I've mainly worked in terms with imaging data with carotid artery ultrasound imaging. And to be honest, they, they're collected in such different ways across different studies, it's very hard to harmonize. I think the, the key that we've come up with is seeing how much you can harmonize and then doing a hell of a lot of <laughs> sensitivity testing just to check if you drop out one small study, does it change um, the, the, the averages and the, the yeah. distributions? So being able to combine all the data, but making sure you've done a lot of quality control and a lot of checking to make sure that it's appropriate. But that's about the best we can do until everyone does the same thing. And that's, <laughs> is that ever going to happen? <laughs> that effect otherwise, right? And that's going to throw, yeah, so. Yeah. <laughs> So yeah, and, and this this harkens back to where we were with say RNA seq maybe uh, ten years ago, something like that. So so, but I guess uh, one of the things that that really helped the RNA seq situation was the community kind of coming together and, and really uh, circling around particular standards. I guess that's kind of still happening, but certainly with very calling and all that, uh, we're more or less there. So I guess to ask you, like uh, in terms and and also to extend it to Andre, in terms of. What do we need from the imaging community? We're, we're going to be at OHBM in Montreal asking similar questions, but what do we need from the imaging community to be able to really meaningfully do this kind of harmonization? Maybe if if I may, to the to the previous um, discussion, um, I think that um, we should uh, run uh, our data, neural imaging, imaging and so on, uh, through some standardized pipelines. Um, I mean pipelines which would cover uh, QC steps, as it was mentioned, uh, data preprocessing, um, uh, then some data transformation and maybe extraction transform and load uh, into uh, desired form, basically. Yes. So uh, that's the first uh, thing. And here I would like to maybe mention one great, if, great example of uh, such pipeline. Um, I would like to uh, highlight by uh, neuroimaging pipeline, which is developed uh, in uh, Docker. Uh, we are Docker uh, technology, and this was developed by FSL Oxford Group. Uh, and uh, I would like to uh, mention here Fidel Alfagro from FSL Oxford Group. Uh, we uh, had a webinar uh, 
imaging um, advanced uh, ad, advanced imaging webinar in December. So so maybe for those who are in, interested, I would recommend uh, watching. And my answer to your question is really re related to that is that, yes, it would be really nice to have uh, community members contributing with such pipelines uh, to, okay, our DNA Nexus community and to UKB wrap, but overall, o o o over the world, I would like to see the trend that people are sharing their pipelines, people are sharing uh, their standardization uh, processes, uh, writing publications about that, uh, and uh, have a great uh, level of uh, reproducibility, yeah, of the research. Uh, and uh, like, not just for imaging and for just like extracting image derived phenotypes, but uh, for any other uh, pipelines for in the life sciences domain and, and biomedical area, yeah. So I guess, uh, I guess that maybe to kick it back over to uh... Rhoda and Suda. So, so Docker's uh, sort of a, a, a clear one, a, a clear example of what we could do, and, and that the the IDB pipeline uh, that that uh, really Fidel and uh, others have put together at Oxford have, has been amazing. Uh, but sort of besides Docker, uh, you know, how does cloud computing really help uh, uh, sort of uh, mediate these large scale multimodal analysis? Like, uh, I mean, what what are you seeing in your day to day uh, that's uh, really helpful? Can I just say that um, yeah, you can say having, <laughs> having pipelines in uh, Docker, my one attempt at using Docker was not successful. Um, and there are a lot of biologists who don't have the computational skills necessarily to get around the issues I came up with. <laughs> I'm sorry if that's a stupid point, but it's a reality. <laughs> Uh, so yeah, actually, no, that's a that's a really good point. I mean, Rhoda, do you think there needs to be more education around Docker? I mean, there's a Docker camp from the University of Arizona that's like super great. But like, what else do we need to be doing as a community? And, and this is actually perhaps another community thing, perhaps a basal community thing we need to be doing. What do we need to be doing as a community uh, to ensure really reproducibility in research? I mean, is education uh, like sort of a fundamental thing there? Well, as to my knowledge, a lot more of the biosciences programs have bioinformatics and computational modules and components. So that's a fantastic start. I'm hoping that with things being on the cloud, like on DNA Nexus, it makes it a lot easier that I don't have to learn all of these computational methods because I'm a biochemist. I'm not a computational person. <laughs> I just happen to work with big data. Um, so I'm really, really hoping that the, the cloud computing, I mean, a lot of the time there is stuff that we can't do on our laptops or PCs because it's just too big and intensive. So that's another bonus. Being able to integrate all these big data sets needs more computational power and the computational skills. And I'm hoping that the cloud computing makes it a lot easier. <laughs> um, so Suda, you're, you're uh, doing some teaching and, and mentoring and so on. What, where, what are your thoughts on uh, sort of education around reproducibility and, and using the cloud for large data sets? So uh, as far as using the cloud for large data sets, its utility, of course, is obvious. I mean, especially when we're working with bulk data sets, such as imaging. Um, I have worked with IDPs, but I do not want to think about downloading all of that bulk raw imaging data onto HPC and <laughs> trying to process all of that paying for storage. <laughs> and uh, so, yeah, so there are these obvious advantages of uh, computing on the cloud. Um, in terms of education, yes, I, a, a Docker is something that's uh, still up and coming. And so if you could have some uh, uh, modules designed towards uh, educating your different uh, levels like uh, uh, PIs versus uh, uh, people who are still students, um, you know, trying to, because those are the people who actually sit and are going to mm -hmm. analyze the data eventually. So, um, so th designing those kinds of modules with inputs from, uh, from people who are uh, invested in that kind of research, I think will, will help a lot. Um, and, um, 
And as far as uh, there's something else I wanted to say about uh, cloud computing, right? Uh, I, th there's, I just wanted to offer another perspective, uh, you know, in terms of, um, in terms of, you know, all of these canned pipelines that are available in, in DNA uh, Nexus uh, for cloud computing, which are, of course, tremendously useful. But uh, there are occasions where people just deploy them a little blindly. And there could be pitfalls associated with that. So, um, so if there are any, if there are any errors that that uh, you know um, are associated with any of those pipelines, or there are only certain kind of data sets to which they should be um, you know uh, deployed and not um, on other kinds of data sets, and researchers are not aware of that, or that has not been made very obvious, and people go and use a one size fits all click and deploy publish results kind of an approach it can it can quickly get tricky so um there are some pitfalls to that as well that we need to consider i think well so suda and, and i i got a parking lot this because this could go in a crazy direction but i mean like really we we live in the world of chat gpt now right so theoretically <laughs> Anybody can write code and use it out of any scope anywhere, right? So I think I think it's a very interesting question to think about how do we help people like scope their domain and bring in experts at the appropriate time, right? But like, let's maybe bring that in at the end. Uh, so because I, I I feel like I should uh, should ask more uh, sort of specific questions uh, pertinent to our audience. Uh, that said. Um, you know, uh, Rhoda, I also wanted to mention this. This may be a harbinger of doom, but I, I was a biochemist at one point, and, and there's sort of a natural evolution towards uh, the technical side of things. So just it, it could happen to you. Uh, but anyway, I, I wanted to move back uh, a little bit and ask uh, ask you guys, all of you, about uh, the, the sort of obvious uh, pun intended 800 pound gorilla in the room about the UK Biobank and, and how the UK Biobank is, is helping you with that, I mean, uh, you know, I mean, obviously, like, you know, they and that's great, blah, blah, blah. But, like, I mean, really, obviously, it's it's the most sort of large-scale multimodal data set in the world right now. Um, and so perhaps if you could talk a little bit specifically, uh, it's been mentioned by everybody here about how this this helps some of the multimodal data challenges and what, what you can do with the wrap up, uh, noting Suda's obvious warning, which makes a lot of sense. I spend a lot of time talking to users about that too. Um, uh, and, and if the audience wants to get into that, please type stuff in the chat. You know, I mean, when do you need to bring in uh, co experts uh, with GWAS? Uh, when do you need to understand your covariance better? When are you just doing garbage in, garbage out kind of things? I mean, like, if people have those kinds of questions, please chime in. But with that, um, Suda, Rona, Andre, um, Let's talk a little bit more specifically about the UK Biobank. Um, so specifically about the UK Biobank, one of the one of the things that I've learned from conducting this research, at least the, the research project that I was just talking about, was that um, you know the epidemiological design is very important. So um, so UK Biobank is amazing in that you have roughly a half a million samples that are genotyped and phenotyped, and you have imaging data currently available for around 40,000 people with 100,000 people that are going to be imaged in the future. Um, and uh, it's it's kind of mind blowing how much data there is and how much you can do with that. I mean, it's crazy. <laughs> and what is also amazing is, uh, is, is the kind of data processing they've done for the imaging data itself and made it available as IDTs, uh, you know, for, for people to um, play around with. So that's, um, that's a huge effort and, uh, and super commendable. Um, uh, the generalizability to, um, to ethnic groups outside of white European is, is a little challenging with the UK Biobank because um, it's all predominantly white European at this point. And, um, the other, the, and, and I mentioned the epidemiological design. So it's a perspective cohort with relatively healthy individuals, there's going to be some survivor bias and volunteer bias. Um, so those things kind of get baked in uh, also. And um, so it's, it's, it's critically important. And this is what we try to do in the study that I was talking about previously uh, to kind of replicate your results in an independent cohort outside of UK Biobank. And so it, it, it isn't just focused on 
one healthy prospective cohort alone, although it is half a million samples. Um, so, so that you look at, you know, other kinds of, say, medical biobanks, for instance. And while I was at, uh, a postdoc, I, I worked with one such uh, biobank, that's the Penn Medicine Biobank at Penn. And so, uh, since it's a medical biobank, you have um, a lot more patients that have other afflictions of disease as compared to, um, you know, a healthy cohort. And so, the um, a penetrance of disease associated gene appearance is going to be higher. Uh, and so, uh, you could use uh, get away with using a smaller sample size, um, and you know, if it's if the penetrance of the variance is going to be higher, and so it's still going to be well covered. And uh, you could potentially use a cohort like that if you have access to it um, to replicate the results you get from UK Biobank. And I think that could be a truly powerful way to um, showcase the robustness of your results. Um, and um, and and also uh, there are efforts out there uh, to um, you know to replicate what UK Biobank has done, but with other ethnic groups. And so I um, applaud those efforts also. Uh, one such effort is currently has been funded a multi-million dollar um, of effort at Penn State. It's being spearheaded by a faculty member from Biobehavioral Health the Department that I'm in right now, but focused on Hispanic populations. Um, so um, so yeah, it's 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 great. It's uh, there's a lot of lot of publicly available data out there. UK Biobank is awesome. Uh, UK Biobank, one of the I think really cool things about it is that it it has created this community. So uh, since all of the uh, you know the research proposals, uh, at least the abstracts are accessible, so you can go and look up on the uh, you know uh, on the website as to w what kind of research others are doing in that space. And so uh, it kind of creates this sense of community, I think, which is really cool, which we didn't have before. And um, and of course, globally it levels the playing field, especially for uh, for people like me um, who are new PIs. Sometimes we do not have access to, um, you know, being a part of some of these large scale consortia like Global Lipids Genetics Consortium or um, you know the Giant Consortium for Anthropometric Traits or you know Enigma Consortium. Uh, charge for cardiovascular disease, all of these consortia. And, and typically, researchers only get access to these summary level data because they don't get to play around with individual level data um, unless you're part of that consortium. And so I think UK Biobank uh, kind of levels the playing field like that because you can just go apply for access and then uh, you, have ac you have access to um, all of these tens of thousands, millions of, not millions yet, but uh, hundreds of thousands of uh, samples of data, individual level information, and multimodal, and it's amazing. I've, I've been talking for a while. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I, I would say that I would second that um, it's amazing to have this data, but it's really important that we don't forget the biases that are inherent in the way the data was collected. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, I mean, it it is a fantastic addition to the research that is possible to go on that is possible to carry out. But I think there is still a place for the pre the old style, when I started my career, looking at clinical cohorts. I think there's still a very good place for, for studying those as well and trying to align it. Do you see the same thing in UK Biobank, which is a general population cohort of rather healthy people? Do you see the same sort of associations and relationships between different traits? if you look at a high-risk cardiovascular cohort, for example. So I think, it's, it's, I think it's fantastically important to remember the biases, combine different data sets and look at stability of results as well. But it has been fantastic being able to split the data and do subset analysis, particularly by sex. There is so much that is assumed that men and women are the same, and we really are not <laughs> for so many reasons. So being able to have a well-powered studies with all the biases that we know about, thats we have to accept that, but be able to start looking at things in decent sample sizes of men and women separately is fantastic. So at some yeah. point, you know, around the office, we've been talking about uh, having a, a round table on sort of uh, bringing diverse data sets together. So what I'm hoping we could do is I'm, I'm hoping Suda and Rhoda uh, would be willing to come back uh, maybe in the fall to think about uh, a webinar and put, bringing large uh, diverse data sets together. Um, I want to finish uh, by thinking about 
uh, single cell and uh, visualization um, and, and really uh, thinking about uh, really the future of what we're doing uh, with UK Biobank as the proteomic data, as well as uh, the uh, single cell data uh, come online um, and what, what the possibilities are there. And I will say personally that, that this is the data set uh, the single cell data is really the the data set that I am, I am the most excited about. I think I think really it's going to blow open a lot of things uh, with the first sort of tranche of of five thousand folks uh, having single cell data. Um, and so Andre, maybe we'll start with you uh, since I, I feel like I haven't put you on the spot enough, uh, and then move uh, move to to Rona and then uh, Suda. Yes, thanks, Ben. Actually, I would like to briefly talk about machine learning because, as you know, um, I'm a machine learning enthusiast. And um, what is uh, really uh, what I love on UKB uh, data, uh, this is for the first time in my life where I can apply my, let's say, advanced uh, machine learning imaging methods on very large data sets in scale. And I really like it, let's say, for the first time, I was able to do some experiments uh, with the Monai li library uh, and let's say even more augment my imaging data sets and let's say compute some kind of more image derived uh, phenotypes, uh, which might then be uh, um, saved into database and later uh, used for Jivas or FIVAS work. So uh, that's that's the thing I really like on the uh, UKB. Yeah, so, yeah. Uh, thanks, Andre. Why, why don't we move over uh, to, to Rona, uh, really to, to start thinking about uh, single cell and uh, RNA-seq data and how that's going to play in. I have no idea how I'm going to incorporate that. I think it's very cool. Um, can't quite get my head around it because I don't know enough about which data there is, <laughs> to be honest. Um, yeah, it's it's pretty cool, but how do you look at it? I mean, machine learning is the obvious way to look at it when you have so much data. and. A cell doesn't work on its own, so it has to talk to its neighbors. So what is expressing is really cool. But yeah, theoretically, I can't get my head around it. And if you go into machine learning, as I said, I'm not, I'm not maybe computationally up to that. <laughs> so I try, before we get there. Oh, before we get to Suda, uh, and uh, who has, uh, I think, all the answers for us. Um, really, so uh, Rhoda and Andre, how do we get uh, machine learning people together with subject matter experts? I mean, we. We, we know from the other side that if people just throw machine learning algorithms and things, you get garbage out. Uh, and so how do we how do we build a community where machine learning experts can really interface uh, with subject matter experts and and, and really uh, push out sort of meaningful, uh, meaningful results? That's a really great question, actually. So, uh, yeah, we can maybe talk uh, more about it to, together and uh, there should be because um, for uh, in terms of or for data interpretation it could be sometimes difficult yes like to um, convey message what the model is, is, is saying because typically machine learning engineers are tech savvy people uh, yeah that's 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 actually really a great question and uh, uh, we can maybe think more about explainable models, you know, like, yeah, mm, that might be the possible solution, but uh, because there are some like levels of communication, we can commu communicate on the technical level, like, I mean, computers speak and then like people, you know, so yeah, mm, yeah, it's not. Uh, from my side, it's not easy to answer right now, but yeah, great, great topic. Yeah, definitely. So you heard it here first. SHAP is the answer to everything. Just kidding, kidding. That was a joke. All right. So uh, now, uh, I guess unless Rona has something to chip in on that, uh, let's let's head over to Suda, um, and then um, you know we'll we'll finish up with a discussion of uh, sort of uh, machine learning subject matter expert speed dating. That was also a joke. Uh, let's give Suda the last <laughs> word, and and then we'll go ahead and wrap up. So is the question about single cells still? Uh, 
Yeah, well, you can talk about whatever you want again, but let's go. Uh, let's talk about single cell and visualization, and then let's talk about machine learning and subject matter expert. Yeah, I'm, I'm with I'm with Rona on this one. I mean, it's it's hard to kind of wrap your head around how much, how many layers you have to kind of accommodate uh, when you talk about data visualization with single cell data. I do know that um, coming from the stat department, there are lots of efforts currently underway in just analysis of single cell data on a small set of samples right now because sparsity in data is a big issue sparsity in single cell data and statistically that presents a lot of challenges so we have to uh, so people are actually working on developing novel ways to work around that um and you're saying that 5000 single cell data for 5000 individuals is going to be released and so i can't even think about how we can uh, scale this to biobank level data. <laughs> and, uh, I mean, <laughs> uh, and also in terms of visualization, that's, um, you know, that's an entirely, that's multiple layers that you're adding it to it, right? In terms of cell type specificity, right? So um, I, I, I really, yeah, visualization is going to be also very interesting and a big challenge with single cell. But I think that is the direction in which the field is moving. And that is sort of research for the future, yes. Uh, and so the more resources we invest in that domain, um, the better off we're likely going to be. So uh, that's all I have to say. <laughs> uh, awesome. Cool. Well, no, I mean, uh, you know, it's it's fun to hear that, you know, what we're working on is is really sort of at the, the forefront of a lot of people's minds in terms of how to tap think about integrating visualization of single cell uh, with integration uh, of uh, these or phenotype genotype imaging things. And uh, yeah, it's a, it's a lot of fun. And if anybody wants to collaborate on that, let us know. Uh, so I'd like to wrap by thanking our presenters very much for uh, um, putting stuff, uh, you know, out there, putting stuff in the chat. I think it was, you know, we touched on uh, maybe 12, 13, 14 different topics. So, uh, we really, we covered a lot of ground. If you want to go ahead and check this out, uh, please check things out. Uh, some of uh, Suda's papers are already in the chat. Um, I'll add uh, one paper about bioinformatics speed dating, uh, just to sort of open the discussion between uh, uh, machine learning and uh, subject matter experts, putting them together. Um, and uh, just for fun. Um, and uh, yeah, if you have ideas for other roundtables, webinars, uh, or more specific deep dives into some of these uh, topics, let us know, uh, write, a, write an email to me or support at dnanexus.com. Um, for those of you who come to lots of our webinars, uh, it's great to see you. Uh, hi, Megan. Um, and uh, yeah, if you have any questions, I think we have uh, like uh, two minutes left uh, for uh, Q&A. So uh, please, 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 we'll, uh, we'll give people about 30 seconds to type stuff into the chat. Um, and then we'll uh, we'll go from there. In terms of setting up standards, if UK Biobank's got the biggest single cell data and you produce something that people can understand, maybe you set the standard. Well, so I will say, and, and this is really a question more for Biobanks, so, uh, Rory Collins and Mark Effingham, but I will say that uh, I believe technically that the UK Biobank will be the third largest a uh, single cell repository in the world once that data hits the streets. Now, that said, um, uh, it also comes with obviously the massive WGS as well as the uh, the massive, huge phenotype data. Uh, so uh, with all of that, of course, it's the, the largest in the world. Uh, but yeah, I mean, uh, really interfacing between uh, human cell atlas, um, and and some other large single cell databases, I think will be super useful. So uh, yeah, that's that's awesome. Um, yes. Uh, so if uh, if you go over to the UK Biobank website, uh, they will talk about uh, single cell data that that will be uh, available. So uh, yeah, uh, something to check out. Uh, really, uh, upcoming data releases are announced. Uh, both uh, by UK Biobank uh, as well as DNA Nexus, uh, the UKB research analysis platform. So jump on one or both of our newsletters, and uh, you'll you'll see cool things coming out. Uh, thanks for your question.
Uh, if there's no other questions, uh, we're at the hour. We're going to go ahead and wrap. Thanks, everybody, for being here. Thanks for everything you do in science and all that. Have a great day and rest of the week. All right. Thanks, everybody. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks. All right. Bye-bye.